Thank you very much, um, Keith. And a special thanks to Nicola, Nikolai and the Clinton School for, for, for having me here. It's, it's, I live in Vermont, and, and this is my first trip to Arkansas, and I'm delighted, so thank you very much. Um, I'm going to talk for a half hour or so and then throw this open to questions. So um, before I start, though, I want us all to, uh, to have a moment of sympathy for the woman that I live with. And I'll, I'll tell you why. I, I write investigative articles about how food's produced. That's been my career, and investigative books about how food is really produced. And it might not be apparent from my physique, but one of the occupational hazards of writing about how food is produced is that you stop eating a lot of things that you once eat, you once ate. I mean, I gave up winter tomatoes um, for good after writing a book exposing slavery in the Florida tomato fields. Um, I, I gave up bagged greens after Gourmet Magazine sent me out to the Salinas Valley after that E. coli outbreak about 10 years ago that killed dozens of people, bagged salad greens. Um, long ago, I gave up eating pre-ground hamburger and, and even farmed shrimp because of the conditions they're raised in. So when I came to my partner and said, honey, I got a great book idea. I'm going to write about pork production. She gave me that look that partners occasionally give other partners and said, this better not mean I have to give up bacon. <laughs> so, with that sword of Damocles hanging over my head, I spent two years trying to answer her question. Could we find bacon or any pork product that we could eat with good conscience. Um, so my first step when I started thinking about this project is, well, if you're going to eat an animal, raise and slaughter and eat an animal, at very least, you owe it to that animal and yourself, really, to learn as much as possible about what that animal really is. In fact, I'll go to say in case of pigs, who those animals really are. So you can understand really what sort of act you're taking part in. Now, who here is, is familiar with pigs? Raised pigs, no pigs? Yeah, come on, it's Arkansas, okay. <laughs> um, I too had raised pigs, a few at a time, for, for several years. Um, and I knew they were smart. We all know pigs are smart, right? You've heard that pigs are smarter than dogs and this and that. That's true. But until I started the research of this book, I had no idea how incredibly intelligent, sensitive, social an animal a pig is. Um, <laughs> Uh, not that intelligent, but this is not, this is not quite as entertaining a photograph. But it, took, it was taken at the University of Pennsylvania about 20 years ago in the mid-1990s. And it was an experiment conducted by a, a PhD student named Candace Crony, who's now a professor um, specializing in livestock ethics at um, <clears throat> Purdue University in Indiana. But Crony, she'd come from Trinidad. She grew up in Trinidad. And she loved all animals. Even brought home lizards and fixed their legs if they were broken, and frogs, and cats, you name it, dogs. Um, her, her mother was an emergency room nurse, so her mother taught her how to mend these animals. The one animal she hated was the pig. It was exacerbated by the fact that her family um, for religious reasons, didn't, didn't have anything to do with pork. So she graduates from the University of Pennsylvania with a master's degree. And some of you students may 
understand where she had absolutely no idea what the hell she was going to do with her life now that she had this, this. And so one of the senior professors there in animal cognition came up to her and said, I want you to be my, one of my PhD students. And she was elated. You know, this was a big honor. And she said, great, what do you want me to do? And this eminent professor said, I want you to teach pigs how to use a computer. And she told me she sat there sort of waiting for the punchline, and it never came. And that's what she had to do. This pig is, you, you can sort of see it here, this thing here um, is an old game box, Xbox or something like that. And the students at the university, the, the, the agricultural engineering students, affixed a tractor gear shift knob to the joystick. The computer is inside a plexiglass case. And you see that little bright light there, sorry for the shaky aim, in the center? That's the cursor. And on either side, you've got a lit up border. And so what pigs learned to do was to nuzzle that joystick so it moved the cursor so it got the cursor over to the one of the colored areas. And at that point, a machine on the other side of the room would spit out some M&Ms. Pigs, pigs love M&Ms if you want to you know, make quick friends with a pig. And then as time went by, she made the target areas smaller and smaller and smaller until they became only one target area that was smaller than the cursor. And the pigs got it. The pigs could do it consistently. Now think about this for a minute. What is there in the, a pig's natural world that would give it any right or reason to figure that out? What does a pig do? It sticks its nose in the muck, roots around, the nose encounters an acorn, it eats, or whatever it encounters. The food is there, it's one and one. How can a pig figure out that if I push that knob around, it will move that stupid little light around on the screen, and if I push that knob in such a way that the light goes over into the, one of the target areas, that machine way across the room, separated in distance and time, will spit me out an M&M. &M. And they got it. They didn't just do it once. Once they figured it out, they could just got it. Time and time again. These pigs were amazing in, in, in other ways because when Crony got them, they were just industrial piglets. When she got them, the first thing she would do is, is uh, house train them or laboratory train them. And they learned immediately, way quicker than a dog or cat. They would use one particular designated area as their bathroom, Did nothing else. And they learned immediately. She wanted to teach them some basic commands because they were going to be working with students. So she had these pigs learn to sit, come, basic dog tricks, lie down. Pigs learned them after one or two tries, way quicker than any dog. She wanted the pigs to have an enriched life, mentally stimulating, so she provided the pigs with various toys, balls, bowling pins, things like that. But so that they would keep st stimulated, she had established a rule that the pig could play with any toy. Pig could play, the toys were all kept in a big bin. Pig could play with any toy it wanted, but only one toy at a time. If it wanted another toy, it had to take the original toy back, put it in the bin, get another toy out. At the end of the day, being a graduate student and having important studying, I guess that's what graduate students always do after classes, studying to do, these students wanted to get the hell out of the lab. So they trained the pigs to pick everything up and put it away. Pigs loved it. No, I mean, I was never, a, I had three daughters, and I was never able to institute um, anything close to that sort of, that sort of uh, policy in our recreation room. Um, but no, pigs, fine. And it went on and on. Um, 
the pigs, she decided, well, let's see if they can, how they deal with symbols. So she sent her students into a big industrial pig barn, and half the students wore t-shirts with an X on them, half the t-shirts had an O. But only the O's fed the pigs. Well, instantly, the pigs really, you know, they wouldn't pay any attention to if you were, had an X. If you were an O, they were your best friend. So she changed it. The, the t-shirts changed, stayed the same, but she just had the students carry a wooden block in their hand, either in an X or an O shape. The pigs got it immediately. They could transfer the one two-dimensional to the three-dimensional. They, they had the concept. It wasn't just, it's the same as with the computer game. They can think. Um, other research shows that pigs actually know and never forget and can work well with 80 other pigs. And, you know, think about that. This is, you know, they have 80, 80 pigs they know well. And these aren't just Facebook friends. These are, no, these are, no, I mean, these are pigs they really know and can work with. Humans, the psychologists say it's like between 100 and 200 people that we know and work with. You, you know, we might know a lot more, but, you know, that's why the Roman centurion and all the, these groups, effective group size. So pigs and humans, you know, kind of will operate in the same social world. Um, my favorite thing about Crony's research is the University of Pennsylvania Ag School has a uh, visitor's day every year. And all the families would come with their little kids to see the computer playing pigs. And graduate students being graduate students, the, <laughs> um, the, the team that was doing this computer work with the pigs would have a pig come up and work the computer, get its M&Ms, and then they'd, they'd pick out a child and say, you try it. And half the time the child couldn't get it. And the parents would turn all red and go, come on, a pig can do it. <laughs> I, I know some parents like that from a, a well-to-do town near where I live. Um, but they shouldn't have felt bad because around that time a professor at Cambridge University, famous animal intelligence person, did tests that show that pigs have the cognitive abilities of a three-year-old human. Think of that. Um, they you know, have, have astounded researchers in, in, in a lot of other ways. There's a new way of feeding industrial pigs where and originally the pigs wore collars with microchips in them, and the pig could go up to a feeding station, and if the pig hadn't eaten that day, the microchip would tell a gate at the feeding station, it's okay, open up, let the pig in to feed. Pig would go in, feed, and if it, came, if it had fed that day, the gate wouldn't open up. They had to give that system, quit using that system, because the pigs quickly learned that if somebody lost their collar, and you picked it up in your mouth and took it over to the feeding station, you could often cage another, another meal. I figured that right out. Another pigs in an industrial setting, they were doing experiments and not trying to figure out the ideal temperatures. These were at some ag school, the ideal temperatures to keep, keep pigs at. What's the ideal temperature for sows and their babies? And Somebody got the bright idea, well, why don't we rig up a thermometer that a pig can actually operate, or a thermostat that a pig can operate? And sure enough, the pigs did. They used to think that pigs should be kept at around 80 degrees. But these pigs turned the thermostat down to about 72 during the day, and then lowered it to 65 at night, saving, you know, huge amounts on, on heating. And, and <laughs> but, you know... All true stories. Um, I had a friend who, you know, pigs are also very emotionally intelligent. I had a friend who kept a pet pig for 14 years. She wrote about it in a book called The Good, Good Pig. It's a hilarious book. But this pig, his name was Christopher Hogwood, for you uh, classical mu music enthusiasts. Um, and Hogwood turned into this 750-pound boar, but he was as nice as pig as you could imagine. 
And he had different sounds for everybody in his life. Um, Sai, the owner, had a high-pitched sort of friendly. Her husband had a slightly deeper-pitched thing. She had a great fat friend, a 350-pound guy who would come around very seldom. But as soon as Christopher saw this guy, it was like, ah, comrade in corpulence. <laughs> and he let, he let out this huge grunt, like this unearthly <laughs> And, you know, the guy came back eight months later and Christopher instantly, before he even saw the guy, as soon as he smelt that he was around, let out, started letting out the same grunt, never used it before. They had two little girls who lived next door and the pig had special grunts for them. And they moved away and didn't come back for years. And when they came back, they'd turn from literally skinny beans, you know, bean sprout, country girls to, to, uh, to mature, suburban, aeropostel-wearing young women. Before he saw them, he, he issued those same grunts that he hadn't issued in years. I mean, think about that. They, for an animal that's so focused, they wouldn't have looked anything like they did. And for an animal so focused on smell, a pig can smell something seven miles away to eat. Um, they would have, you know, with hormones and things, they would have smelled total, more importance. He recognized them. Um, and culturally, humans, we, modern humans, owe a huge debt of gratitude to pigs. If you ever look into a pig's eye, you'll see it. The same way as you look into a dog's face, you can see there's communication there. And in fact, pigs were the very first domesticated livestock. Dogs came considerably before, but livestock, pigs were the first. In fact, pigs were domesticated before any crop was domesticated. 10,000 years ago in an area in what is now southeastern Turkey, near Syrian border, a tribe of hunter-gatherers, which everybody was then, for some reason settled down. Probably because the population had gotten too high. And so you couldn't go over to the next valley because there was already a tribe there. Settled down. But they didn't stop hunting and gathering. They just stayed in the same place and went off around their their settlement to hunt and gather. They didn't have crops. But what they started to do almost immediately, according to the archaeological evidence, is keeping pigs. It was clear that they had domesticated pig. And further research shows that what these pigs were was really kind of an insurance policy. They're wild boars. Pigs are the same species. To this day, a wild boar and a pig can mate. They're, they're the, they're, they're just the same species, was an insurance policy because if hunting was bad or the disease had swept the goats and deer or whatever else you were hunting, to have a resident group of pigs was your fallback. And so pigs really enabled them to successfully settle down and eventually start growing crops and so on and so forth. Without pigs, it's hard to see how that could have happened quite so easily. And, you know, they, they've been our constant companions. When Columbus, a, a wise man, and on his second voyage over, you know, after he'd sort of said, hey, there's something over on the other side of the ocean, he uh, cleverly brought along, in addition with 12,000 or 1,200 sailors, uh, 13 pigs. And so pigs hit the New World on Columbus's second voyage. He dumped them off in Hispanola, which is the island that the Dominican Republic and Haiti share now dumped them off there, and the pigs ran off into the woods, and they do what pigs do better than any animal going. You know what that is? Make more baby pigs. Think of, this is why they, you know, why they were a popular thing to domesticate early. I mean, it didn't, doesn't make sense to domesticate as nasty an animal as a wild boar unless you get a big payoff. Well, the big payoff is, a, even a wild sow, 
can have a 12, 8 to 12 piglets a year. I mean, that's like rabbit level breeding. You know, what other big animal does that? And then those, eight, those piglets are ready to eat in six months. You know, a cow takes, what, 18 months, two years? Um, six months, those piglets are eating size. Eight months, those piglets are ready to have their own piglets. And so you can see how, you know, Columbus lets his pigs loose on Hispanola, and within a very few years, the place was overrun with, with feral pigs. And every Spanish conquistador um, wouldn't set out without a boatload of, of pigs with him. De Soto, who you know, came through here in the 1500s, he set out with 700 pigs. And the first thing that happened was the, the native Indians discovered that pork tasted good, so, so they took a lot of those pigs. And then every time he crossed a river, between the coast, the Atlantic coast and here, he lost more pigs in the current and they just drifted off. In fact, their relatives are still roaming the woods around here as, as, as feral pigs. Um, you know, he, he ate pigs on the way, went all the way out, did his loop, came back two years later, and he had with him 700 pigs. Um, so, you know, it was like, you can explore a whole continent, lose half your pigs to flood and, and, and stealing, and you still um, end up with the same number of pigs as you started with. I, I like this picture here. This is what the original pig looked like. This thing's about this big, so it's, it's a fraction the size of a modern pig. Um, and it looks more like a wild boar. You, you might wonder how I have a photograph of a, a pig that, you know, is the same as one in the 1500s. It's because the Spaniards, all, everywhere they went, they marooned pigs on islands. So that the next time they came through, or another Spaniard, there would be pig meat. And one of these islands was off the coast of, uh, of Georgia, called Ossabao Island. And it, that island never got developed. And these pigs, who they were dumped there in about 1570, uh, their ancestors, didn't change. They just stayed. They're still on the island, but people have taken them off and are, are breeding them elsewhere. But uh, so this little guy was the, the pig that, that explored the new world. When people crossed, the pioneers crossed the Appalachians and f into, the, into the Ohio <clears throat> River Valley, Again, pigs. How we, you know, you'd, you're, the typical deal was you'd, you'd have a few pigs, you'd settle in your land. That first summer, you'd have to clear, build a structure, get land ready for crops. And your pigs would stick around. And you, know, you would eat them. They would have babies. You could ship the babies off to market and make a little money. You couldn't have really settled the Midwest without pigs. Um, it's what Temple Grandin called the ancient contract between humans and pigs. And that deal was basically, pig, you know, we'll protect your babies. We'll feed you when you're hungry. We'll, we'll, we'll provide shelter for you. In return, um, sorry, but, you know, we're going to eat some of you. Um, and you had to do it right. The ancient contract was we had to live, we had to give pigs a good life or they'd die. And that went from 10,000 years ago, this ancient contract, until 30 years ago. 30 years ago. And here's what happened 30 years ago. This is the way 97% of the pigs, 97% of the 110 million pigs that are raised in the United States every year live. This is what we've done with them. I went into an, a, one of these operations in Iowa. Um, I just want to read a little bit about my experience there. This guy. Um, I'd been told he was a nice fellow and, and he would show me his pig operation. He, he raises 150,000 pigs a year in one farm. And so I called him up, left a message, and got a, got a call back on my phone a little while later and this gruff voice said, 
Why the hell should I let you on my property? You're a muckraker. And so, <laughs> this isn't doing, going very well. But anyway, I eventually said, you know, people tell me you do it right and that you don't mind. And, you know, and, you know. and he said, okay, you know, I'll kick myself for this, but you can come into my barn. Uh, his name was Craig Rowles. So here's what happened. Um, Craig, who was a lot friend, more friendly when I met him in person, told me we were going to go and visit Pharaoh One. Pharaoh is the term that pig raisers use for the, when pigs give birth. Pharaoh, Pharaoh One houses 2,400 sows. Each sow produces a litter of piglets every five months. On average, litters contain between 10 and 11 piglets that survive until they are old enough to wean, meaning that Pharaoh One alone produces about 60,000 pigs a year, a small city's worth. Pharaoh One stood a mile or so down a gravel road off Route 30, an east-west highway in Iowa. The farm consisted of a cluster of low-slung buildings with a few pickup trucks outside. After pulling into the parking lot, Rowles handed me a pair of boot-shaped clear plastics bags and kept a pair for himself. He told me to open the door of the pickup, stick my feet outside, making sure they touched nothing. Only after I'd pulled the booties over my shoes could I put my feet on the ground. Once we'd both done that, we shuffled over to a small addition to the main pig barns and stepped inside. The rank odor of dung and ammonia walloped me, but Rawls didn't seem to notice. He told me to hang up my coat on a hook by the door and to sit on a bench that bisected a space that resembled a fitness center locker room. But keep your feet on this side, he said. This is the dirty side. Take off the booties and your shoes, leave them on the floor here, then lift your feet and swivel on your butt so that you face the clean side before putting your feet down again. When we had executed that routine, he pointed to a locker. You can put your clothes, watch, pen, notepad, hearing aids, and cell phone in there. Everything. We'll get you a pen and pad inside. Shower and shampoo in the stall and walk through to the other side. There are towels and clothes there. At which point, he dropped his pants. Bet you never stripped bare with anyone else you've interviewed. Rowell's <laughs> joked. Um, that's the procedure you have to go through, everybody has to go through to go into one of these places. Everybody. Even if you work there, it doesn't matter. Every time you go in or go out. Because of disease. These animals are so, they're like on a space station. Um, they're like in a hospital ward. And that's what you have to go through. Even after that, this guy, we didn't know it at the time, but in, within the next three weeks, he would lose 15 thousand pigs in that barn to an epidemic that, that swept through the United States that year. Um, just, it's, um, so, you know, this is, this is, you know, they just live in these cramped conditions. Their feces fall through a slatted floor into what's like a basement, feces and urine, directly below where they live. And there, their excrement stays for up to a year. Um, and then it's pumped out and the stuff is spread on a field and you don't want to be anywhere near that field. But all the ammonia and hydrogen sulfide, both poisonous gases, both, both will kill you, um, comes off that manure, goes up into where the pigs live. They're only kept alive by huge fans on either end of these barns. They look like jet engines that just blow air, enough air, fresh air through and bad air out to keep the pigs alive. I talked to one farmer in central Missouri and an electrical storm knocked out his fans. 500 pigs died before he could get the emergency generator going just from asphyxiation. Um, and it's bad for the people who work there as you can imagine. Studies, the Iowa State University, so that people who work inside these barns have markedly decreased lung capacity over time. 
many of them develop um, develop um, asthma, late life onset asthma, um, from, again, from constant exposure to the gases and the dust and the dander. Um, and it's really bad for all of us, the whole country, because these poor pigs, almost all of them, every day of their lives are fed a low-dose antibiotic, just a little bit in their food, whether they're sick or not in order to allow them to survive these conditions and maybe grow a bit faster. And you know what that does. It's the perfect atmosphere for creating antibiotic-resistant bacteria. So the very drugs you know, that have made infections something we don't worry about anymore. None of us worry when we catch a chest cold that we're going to die. Well, before the advent of antibiotics, you did, because a lot of times you would. You know, since 1940s, when we've had antibiotics, we've been able to forget about typhoid. Who dies from typhoid anymore? Who dies from, you know, even tuberculosis? Um, but the drugs that are used to fight these diseases are being rendered useless by pig farms. Because those low-dose antibiotics means some, some bacteria die, the tougher ones live. Repeat that every you know, half hour or however often bacteria replicate. And you can see that you know, very quickly you've got a population of resistant bacteria that then can go anywhere. They don't stay in the farms. They're carried on the wind, they're carried on people's clothing, they're carried on the meat that you get in grocery stores. 23,000 people a year in the United States die now from bacterial infections that could have been cured 30 years ago with 10 days worth of pills from the doctor. Half of those people die from bacterial infections that originated in these barns. Half, so 12, 13,000 people. Um, it's got a direct harming effect. You know, the people of Des Moines, Iowa are suing a bunch of upstate farmers because the water they drink, the Des Moines water work, is polluted with pig crap. And they can't, they, they've got systems for cleaning this, but it can't keep up. It's at, it gets worse every year, and it can't keep up. So the city of Des Moines water work is suing farmers upstream, saying you've got to stop putting this stuff in the rivers that supply the waters we drink. Um, North Carolina, wells are wrecked. The Pimlico Sound is, you know, billions of fish breed there is, is been wrecked. There's die-offs every year of the hundreds of millions of fish in the rivers there from this pollution, water pollution from the pig farms. Um, a few years ago in, in here, they, they put a 6,000 sow barn up just a few miles away from the Buffalo River. And luckily that's been slowed down, but the, the industry is anxious to expand beyond it where it's concentrated because of these disease outbreaks like I described earlier. In South Carolina, I talked to a woman who can't go out in her yard in the summertime because of the stench. She can't hang her clothes on the line because of the stench. She can't, she's been out and feel, it felt like a nice mist was coming down until she realized that it was pig manure. They, South Car or North Carolina, they spray it way up in the air and hope it to land on the fields, but of course the wind carries it. And it, it's no coincidence that she lives in a predominantly African-American, very poor district. And the people who own the pig farms, nah, they don't live anywhere near there. So, We have this, this is what we've done. And at the same time, these are, these are sows. This is how a sow lives her entire life. They're never, ever, 80% of the sows in the United States never get out of these crates. They're called gestation crates. The only bad thing about this is it's too clean. They've somehow sanitized it. But you can see that these crates, the sow cannot turn around 
Hershey's even, most of them are too fat and chubby. Their bodies are pressing, see that sore there? Their bodies are pressing against the bar, their bars. That's how they live. The sows are not even allowed to move. But it doesn't have to be this way. Small percentage, true, but 3% 3 percentage, 3 of the pigs in this country today live like these guys. These pigs are in Iowa. As you can see, they're on pasture. There's lots of space. It's clean. They've got little houses to go into if it's rainy or cold or they want to go in there at night, but there's no doors on the houses. Um, these pigs happen to belong to a farmer who's in a big organization called Nyman Ranch. There's 700 farmers who've kind of banded together under a marketing umbrella. There's 700 individual farms who raise pigs like this. Nyman Ranch, there's a group of people just across the Missouri border called the Ozark Mountain Pork Cooperative who do the same thing, raising better pigs. Um, you know, until a few years ago, you didn't have any choice. Now, with a little effort, you can get properly raised pigs. Now, this is a pig at a farm in upstate New York. Um, raises Herit, but are called heritage pigs, not the pink pigs, but old breeds. Sells to the best restaurants in New York City. Makes a good living for his family and himself, and really good pork. And <laughs> an industrial farmer will tell you a sow has to be crated because she's so vicious. And as you can see here, they are pretty vicious, all right. Um, this is, a, a, again, a sow that's uh, owned, by, owned by Nyman Ranch. And five years ago, if I were making this talk, this would be sort of pie in the sky. You'd have to know somebody who had pigs, raise pigs yourself. It was almost impossible to get pork that was raised like this as opposed to the other. But now it's cropping up all over. You can get it at supermarkets. You can get it at Whole Foods. You can get it at the farmer's market. Um, you can get it at specialty butcher shops. And most good restaurants are now, you'll notice, selling pork noodle they'll say from so-and-so's farm. So it's really changed. So what's happened in the, neck, in the last few years is we now have a choice. Whenever you buy a pork product, with your money, you're casting a ballot. Do you want commodity pork, the other white meat? You're voting for this. That's how, you know, Sal will never be near her piglets. Or if you buy the right pork, you're voting for that. And I think, you know, all I ask is the next time you make a perch pork, a pork purchase, just think, whether it's in a restaurant, a supermarket, farmer's market, do you want your money to go to her, the system that, that allows her to live, or the system that allows her to live? I mean, the choice is now yours, ours. Thank you. I have time for some questions. Thank you, Greg. Let's do take some questions. Yes. Okay. Sir, right here. Coming right at you. Do you have a mic to pass? Yeah. Right here, Bob. Yeah. Hi. My name is Sarah. I'm a first-year student at the Clinton School. Thanks so much for being here and for that talk. Um, my qu I have two questions, actually. Um, the first one, you mentioned that we can purchase pork uh, with the, the correct standards at supermarkets now. Are there any third-party audits in place or any certifications where you know if you look at a label, you'd be able to tell what kind of pork you're purchasing? There are not, none that I would guarantee. Um, you can purchase like by the brand. So you, if you know that Nyman or Ozark Mountain Cooperative, both would probably be available around here. Nyman Ranch or Ozark Mountain Pork Cooperative um, is one way. The other way is if you, you know, a chef at a restaurant, you know, should be, a lot of times now they go out of the way to give you the name. Uh, uh, the final way is at the farmer's market. Again, it's usually automatic that the person there is, is raising pigs properly, but there's no real standard 
yet um, that you can use, unfortunately, that you would tr that I would trust. Yeah. That may be which kind of leads to my second question about the supply and demand of this kind of free range pork. Is there, is it cropping up enough, cropping up enough for there to meet the demand for pork? I mean, particularly bacon probably in this country and in the South in particular, we have a taste for barbecue. So <laughs> um, if there's enough supply to meet kind of the demand. Well, you know, it's, it's the answer is that the, the good, the farmers, especially you know the bigger ones like Nyman Ranch and, and Ozark Cooperative, their main problem is finding enough pigs to meet demand, pigs that are raised properly, um, which is a good problem to have, you know, because it's much more expensive. Um, so it's it's difficult. Barbecue joints, there's a couple now that are are going a chain, small chains, one out of uh, Birmingham. Um, they forget its name. Someone help me. But anyway, it's a 20 or 30, um, which is going over to pasture-raised heritage pork. Um, but it's not, it's not common. Um, barbecue is especially problematic because it is, you know, it's culturally it's a food for the people, which would mean that you, you're going to have difficulty, you know, selling $15 a pound pork on, on uh, paper plates you know, at a, at a, in an atmosphere where everybody, rich, poor, can come and eat. So that's, you're right, there's still ways to go there. Yes, Claire. Hi, my name is Claire Hodgson. I'm also a first year student at the Clinton School. Um, a lot of farming is starting to move into more urban environments. A, mostly because of necessity as we're booming and growing. Have you met with any farmers who were raising pork in more urban environments? And what did that look like? What was the sustainability of that, if you saw that at all? I don't, I think that's, that's not likely to happen. I mean, the only person I know who's tried it, tried it outside of Burlington, Vermont, a moderately large city in Vermont, and it didn't work because, you know, first of all, you do need space. And space, you know, it, financially, it, if you've got the space in an urban setting, you're better to put baby greens or carrots. You're going to be much more profitable, and the neighbors and the, the local ordinance officials aren't going to be on your, your case. So I haven't heard of anybody doing it in any, you know, any real way in, in cities. It's a, it's, a, it's a rural thing, uh, as it probably should be. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Here comes the microphone, sir. How much of the production from these concentrated hog raising operations go towards exports rather than our own domestic consumption here in the United States? Well, we certainly export, I don't know the exact figure, sorry, but we do a considerable not most of our pork, but a huge chunk of our pork is exported. Um, especially now that Smithfield, our biggest pork company, is owned by a Chinese consortium, specifically, you know, to, to ease its way into that market. But we, we grow pork for an export market. Um, there's no question about that. Any other questions? Yes, sir, right here. Mr. Barry, just out of, uh, outside of the U.S., which country eats the most pork? Which country eats? Which, which country eats the most pork? Eats. Yes. Eats? Yes. Oh, China by, by many, many, many fold is the biggest pork eating country. China by way far and away. And it's eating a lot more as they get wealthier because they love, you know, that's sort of their... They're, they're, that occupies the place of beef, kind of in our, you know, it's, it's the meat, the go-to meat. If you've got some, got some, got some money. Um, another large pork-producing country, interestingly, is Denmark, which is, uh, yeah, huge produce. It's only got five million people, and it produces thirty million pigs a year. Um, 
we produce about 110 here. So, in, you know, compare the size. It's a, yeah, a huge export, again, export market. And they can do it without, they interestingly do it without antibiotics and um, some of the other things that we take, uh, which is kind of an example that it can be done on an industrial, co world competitive scale without all these drugs and things. Is there not? Got a question, Sophie, right here. Hi, uh, my name is Sochi Delgado Solorzano. I'm also a first year student here at the Clinton School. Um, as you may know, we have one of the largest meat producers here in our state. Um, do, are these businesses facing any type of significant pressure to change their practices and how they raise pork or any other type of meat? Yeah, interestingly, um, in the past, since about 2014, so two years in the pork industry, there has been basically an avalanche of large pork buyers, McDonald's, Walmart, Kroger's, huge pork buyers, who have gone to these big companies and they have said, those sow crates, those gestation crates you saw where they were all out because our customers are telling us they don't want to eat pork that's produced from sows that live their whole life in little metal cages. And so even the big guys, thank God, those, this type of picture, or particularly the pictures of the sows in the gestation crates where they spend basically their whole lives and never get out of those. Um, that's something that in 10 years, if everything goes as planned, will be gone. It's not fast enough for a lot of people, but at least, and they wouldn't, you know, the government wouldn't pass any laws. It took the uh, consumers going to people like McDonald's and saying, and the Humane Society and groups like that and saying, we don't like this. For McDonald's and these big companies, there's been 60 or 70 of them say, you know, no more crates. And as soon as one big producer moved, they all had to move. So that's the big progress that I've seen. Yes, sir. Got a question right here. Got a question. Uh, on industrial chicken farms, uh, free-range industrially raised chickens tend to face a higher rate of mortality than crate-raised chickens. Do pigs face any similar uh, problems? Um, they, they certainly do. Um, this system here, the, the farrowing crate, do you see that the piglets on the right hand side and then there's that little railing there between the sow right here? So the sow can never roll over. And this is sort of piglet side and sow side. They feed through the bars. And that's to prevent her from rolling over and crushing her piglets, which does happen, particularly in industrial barns. People who raise piglets without this system, um, you know, the, the sows have more room. They select for sows that just are better mothers. Um, but the industrial system has allowed raisers not to select for anything like that. And, and so the sows in an industrial setting have lost that, that kind of instinct. If you see a, a sow in a pasture setting, like, like I, don't, I don't want to leave this up. So. Yeah. I just lost my thing. Anyway, um, like the one with the, in the grass, um, she'll get down like an elephant. She, her, she'll sort of kneel down on, like on her el elbows and then slowly lower her her rump down before she rolls over to start nursing. Uh, you know, an untrained a sow with no maternal instinct just goes flump, and you have a 400 pound animal on top of a 300 pound piglet, or a three pound piglet. Um, so that's why they, they use them. There are systems that are working away from that, though, even in industrial farms, they're still preliminary. But in open farms, it's not a big problem because if your sow doesn't 
if your sow squishes a litter, she's, she's not going to be having another litter for you. And if you've done that for years and years and generations with these heritage animals, you, you've got a, a, a line of sows that are good mothers. It's a, like I say, it's that old, ancient contract. Got a question right here. In, right, right here. Joe, there comes one. Oh. Um, sir, um, you address the, um, the changes that are occurring in the industry because of consumer objections to caged animals. Have there been any changes in antibiotic use? Again, yeah, coming that's a, from that's consumers. A good, that's, that's another area. It hasn't happened with pigs yet, but it certainly happened with chickens. And it's going to happen with, with pigs. And it's the same reason. People have finally said, hey, you know, I'm sorry, I'd rather the antibiotics go to my kid when, when the kid is genuinely sick than to your damn pigs who are perfectly healthy just so you can make a few more bucks. So it's starting. But again, the government won't do a thing. In, European, in the European Union, where it's a different system of farming, the farmers themselves gathered together and said, we're going to go together and get rid of antibiotics. Because if everybody does it, no one has an advantage. You know, it's, it's, uh, we're all on the same playing field. I know there are more questions. I hope you'll ask them when you come visit with Barry as he signs this unique and very interesting book. Nikolai, you were right. It's a great program. Uh, pigtails. Let's thank uh, Barry. And by the way, let's also give a great thanks and welcome. My buddy Jack and his family are here from The Root, which is one of Little Rock's best restaurants and certainly sustainable, good food. Jack, thank you for what you do. Barry, thank you for being here. Thank <laughs> you.